Our bats are in trouble. A non-native fungus has invaded North America and is causing an infection in bats called white nose syndrome. It's decimating bat populations while they hibernate in caves and mines. In some species, the death rate's over 95 percent. Bats are fascinating animals that are vital for a healthy environment. They eat tons of insects every night, benefiting our crops, our forests, our caves, and us. Bats are the primary nighttime insect predators and can eat up to half their body weight in insects in one night. This is equivalent to an average sized human being eating over 300 quarter pound hamburgers every day. Bats are economically valuable. Research suggests that bats save agriculture more than three billion dollars in pest control every year simply by eating insects. In fact, a new study found that annually bats prevent nearly a billion dollars in pest damage to corn crops around the world. They also eat forest pests and human pests such as mosquitoes. Studying bats has led to advancements in science and medicine, including information on hearing, the immune system, and blood anticoagulants. White nose syndrome is a disease that is causing unprecedented death in bats. The disease was named for the fuzzy white fungal growth on the nose, ears, and wings of infected bats. Scientists have identified a previously unknown species of cold-loving fungus as the cause of white nose syndrome. Since its discovery in New York during the winter of 2007, white nose syndrome has spread rapidly through much of the United States and Canada. The disease continues to threaten bat populations across the continent. While the effects of white nose syndrome vary between locations and bat species, overall losses have reached as high as 95 percent in many sites. As of 2012, over 6 million bats had already died due to this disease, and the disease is continuing to spread. Until 2016, the fungus had not infected bats of the western United States. Unfortunately, in March of 2016, a white nose syndrome infected bat was found in the state of Washington. Although we do not know how the fungus that causes white nose syndrome arrived in North America, it is here and spreading quickly. Bats are spreading the fungus to other bats and to caves and mines. However, scientific studies have shown that humans can also spread the fungus to new sites on contaminated equipment and clothing. People are capable of traveling great distances and can increase the rate of spread. Hibernating bats save energy by spending most of their time in a state of inactivity, and their survival depends on the use of fat that was built up during the fall from eating insects. Scientists have demonstrated that bats affected by white nose syndrome arouse from hibernation more frequently and for longer periods than normal. This literally causes them to starve to death because there's no way for the bats to replenish their fat supplies in the winter. In most cases, only a few caves in any area have been specifically tested for white nose syndrome. The fungus is almost certainly more widely distributed than is indicated by individual lists of caves or maps of counties. The fungus is not always visible on affected bats. Sometimes bats with WNS only display unusual behavior, such as flying outside during the day in near freezing weather. You may see dead or dying bats in the entrance of caves or on the ground around the entrance during the winter. Because white nose syndrome is only detected during the winter when bats hibernate, maps showing the documented distribution of WNS do not depict the larger area used by bats when they disperse in summer. Remember, if the fungus is present in the cave, it can be spread by bats or by people. Just because you've not seen dead or affected bats does not mean that the cave is free of the fungus. You should assume that any cave you enter could be a source of the fungus. These decontamination steps are an expansion of good caving techniques and good environmental stewardship. By decontaminating our clothing and equipment, we can greatly minimize the introduction of foreign microbes into cave systems. The decontamination protocols shown in this video were developed by experts in fungi, wildlife diseases, bats, and caves. The protocols were designed to help protect a bat while still allowing access to caves. They attempt to balance ease of use, availability, and safety with effectiveness in killing the fungus that causes white nose syndrome. Specific decontamination requirements vary depending on the local conditions. Always consult with the land managers in the area in which you are caving to find out about specific requirements. Preparing for decontamination begins before you leave for a cave trip. Evaluate your equipment keeping decontamination in mind. Select equipment that will make decontamination easier. 
Waterproof lights are easier to decontaminate than lights that are not waterproof. Consider using rubber boots where appropriate. They're more easily cleaned than leather boots. Before caving, consider which equipment and clothing is necessary for your trip. Everything that is brought into the cave must be decontaminated, so do not bring equipment or clothing that you do not need. If you can keep things from coming in contact with the cave surfaces and sediment, they will not have to be decontaminated. Double bag your second and third light sources, extra pencils, spare batteries, in airtight Ziploc bags so they will not have to be decontaminated if they are not used. Instead, remove the gear and dispose of the bags after exiting the cave. Cameras and other electronic devices can be put in clear cases, such as underwater housings. Only the coverings or cases would need to be decontaminated. Disposable coveralls and boot covers only reduce the amount of dirt that gets onto other equipment. Tyvek is not a barrier to spores. Use of a Tyvek suit still requires that all clothing worn under the Tyvek be decontaminated. Once you arrive at your site, there's additional work to do. Before entering the cave, arrange clean clothes and personal items in the back of the vehicle where they won't come in contact with contaminated equipment and clothing. Place garbage bags and disinfectant wipes within easy reach of the trunk or outside the vehicle for when you return. Now you're ready to go underground. When removing clothing and boots, do not sit in the vehicle or on the tailgate while you wear contaminated clothing. Once you get back from the cave, you will need to decontaminate your clothing and equipment, and you have two options. One, you can heat the equipment using hot water to a temperature that will kill the fungus and deactivate its spores. Or two, you can soak or wipe the equipment with a chemical that has been demonstrated to kill the fungus and deactivate its spores. In this video, we will be providing more specifics on these two approaches. In general, experts agree that using hot water is the preferable approach. Hot water is safer, has less long-term impact on equipment, and does not leave chemicals that have to be disposed of in an environmentally friendly manner. Cave or mine entry should only occur when using clothing, boots, socks, harness, ropes, helmets, packs, headlamps, flashlights, cameras, and other equipment that have been fully cleaned and rinsed following the protocols shown in this video. Under no circumstances should clothing, footwear, or equipment that has been used in a cave or mine in a white nose syndrome affected area be used in an area where white nose syndrome has not been found. This applies even for decontaminated equipment. It is important to remember that when using either approach to decontamination, you must follow these procedures carefully and safely. Always use appropriate personal protective equipment, such as rubber gloves and safety glasses. When using chemicals, always be sure that areas where you do decontamination are well ventilated. Always check the label of any cleaning products or decontamination agents you'll be using. Any chemicals left after decontamination must be disposed of in accordance with label instructions as required by law. Each product you use will have a material safety data sheet. If you do not have the sheet for a product you're using, you can get it from the manufacturer or online. It is a violation of federal law to use, store, or dispose of a regulated product in any manner not prescribed in the approved product label and associated material safety data sheet. Chemical wastewater should never be drained into septic systems. Upon exiting a cave, scrub off any dirt and mud from your clothing, boots, helmet, pack, and other equipment. Remove as much loose dirt and clay as possible. Next, put your equipment that will need to be decontaminated off-site in a sealed plastic bag or a plastic container with a lid. When you return to your car, wipe down the bag with an approved disinfectant wipe. It's preferable to go one step further and place the bag inside a sealed tub and wipe down its exterior to avoid contaminating your vehicle. 
After you return from the cave, remove and contain clothing and equipment in sealed plastic bags and storage containers with lids. Be sure to dispose of or decontaminate bags and storage containers in the same manner as your equipment. The next step in decontaminating cave equipment is cleaning. Clean all the dirt, mud, and guano from the equipment. Hoses, pressure washers, and soaking tubs can be used for this part of the cleanup. It is best to do this step outside to keep indoor areas from being contaminated. Wash all clothing and any appropriate equipment in a washing machine or by hand using conventional detergents. Washing can be done in cold, warm, or hot water. Laboratory testing has found Woolite Fabric Wash to be an effective detergent for this procedure. Woolite helps remove dirt, but it does not decontaminate your clothing or equipment. Equipment that cannot be submerged for washing can be wiped off with a damp cloth. Some types of hard equipment, such as helmets, waterproof lights, and some vertical equipment, can be cleaned in a regular household dishwasher. However, the dishwasher should not use a heated drying cycle to prevent damage to plastics. These cleaning steps are especially important because dirt can prevent the chemical disinfecting products from effectively decontaminating equipment, clothing, and footwear. Following a thorough cleaning, there are two options for decontaminating equipment. The preferred option for equipment decontamination is to use hot water to kill the fungus and its spores. To kill the spores, equipment should be submerged in water that is at least 131 degrees Fahrenheit, 55 degrees Celsius, for a minimum of 20 minutes. These temperature time guidelines were current as of the making of this video. Be sure to check www.whitenosesyndrome.org for current recommendations. If you do not have access to heated water, you can use chemical solutions to decontaminate some types of equipment. Two different types of chemicals have been found to be effective for decontaminating caving and bat handling equipment. Household bleach and quaternary ammonium compounds such as those found in Lysol in Formula 409. The chemicals can be applied in three different ways. Equipment can be submerged in a tub of water containing the correct concentration of chemicals for 10 minutes. The chemical solution can be sprayed on the equipment, or chemical wipes can be used to wipe down all surfaces of the equipment. After any of the chemical treatments, equipment should be rinsed in plain water to minimize impacts to gear and to keep these chemicals from getting introduced into caves and mines the next time the gear is used. It is important to be sure that you are using the right concentration of chemicals to achieve decontamination. A bleach solution for soaking or spraying should be 16.5 ounces of normal household bleach for each gallon of solution needed. For quaternary ammonia compounds, the mixtures depend on the specific product. Mix them according to label directions. A variety of chemical wipes have been tested for white nose syndrome decontamination. They may be used as they come from the package. Be sure that you use a product that's been tested for effectiveness. Some wipes have been found to be effective and some have been found not to be effective. Research is ongoing, so be sure to check the tested and approved wipes list at www.whitenosesyndrome.org and use only tested and approved wipes to decontaminate your equipment. What chemicals can be used depends on the nature of the equipment and on the labeling of the chemicals. Products must be used in accordance with their label. Using chemical wipes on straps is insufficient. The strap should be removed from the equipment and decontaminated using a hot water soak or another method appropriate to the material. Use of twine or other temporary straps that can be disposed of is encouraged. Bleach can be used to decontaminate most types of equipment. It can be used on fabrics and soft porous equipment as well as on non-porous equipment. However, bleach will weaken nylon and other polymers, so it must not be used on nylon packs, clothing, rope, or webbing. Bleach will also degrade aluminum, so it should be used sparingly on metal equipment. Quaternary ammonia compounds are for use on non-porous materials, such as hard plastics, rubber, and metals. They should not be used to decontaminate clothing, fabric cave packs, 
boots, ropes, or webbing. After spraying or wiping with chemical wipes, allow the chemical to sit on the equipment for at least 10 minutes. Rinse equipment that can be submerged in clean water to remove residual chemicals. Equipment that can't be submerged and has been sprayed or wiped with chemical wipes should be thoroughly wiped with a damp cloth using clean water to remove residual chemicals. Note that this caver is not following good safety protocols and is not wearing eye protection or rubber gloves when using chemicals. Don't follow this bad example. Remember, bleach must not be mixed with other chemical cleaners and disinfectants. Mixing chemicals can result in harmful chemicals and vapors being produced. Boots need to be fully scrubbed and rinsed so that all soil and organic material are removed. The entire rubber or leather boots, including soles and leather uppers, can then be decontaminated with a bleach solution for a minimum of 10 minutes, rinsed and air-dried. Alternatively, rubber boots can be soaked in water that is over 131 degrees Fahrenheit, 55 degrees Celsius, for 20 minutes. This is not an appropriate method for products with leather, as they will shrink. Where possible, we recommend rubber caving boots, which withstand harsh decontaminating products and are easily cleaned. It is the responsibility of each individual using vertical equipment, webbing, harnesses, and ropes to ensure that the decontamination protocols in use are chemically compatible with this equipment. Quaternary ammonia compounds such as Lysol are not labeled for use on textiles such as these. Bleach is known to weaken nylon and other polymers that are used to make rope and webbing and should not be used to decontaminate these items. Only Sterling brand rope and webbing have been shown not to be damaged by washing them using woolite detergent. Therefore, most ropes, harnesses, and webbing should only be decontaminated using heated water. Clean non-submersible equipment thoroughly with soap and water or use disinfecting wipes. Decontaminate by applying one of the recommended chemical products to the outside surface for a minimum of 10 minutes. Rinse and dry. Do not bring unnecessary electronic equipment underground. Cameras and similar equipment can be placed in a plastic housing or wrapped in plastic wrap. Plastic wrap should be discarded after use. If using plastic wrap is not practical, disinfecting wipes can be applied directly on camera surfaces or plastic casings. Decontamination requirements for visiting multiple caves in an area vary greatly depending on a number of factors. These include the white nose syndrome status of the area, interconnectedness of the caves, information on bat usage of the caves, and policies of local land managers. Check with local land managers to determine what level of decontamination is needed between specific sets of caves. However, if there's any doubt as to the policy, always decontaminate between visits to different caves, even if they're close together. In less than a decade, we've made substantial progress in understanding white nose syndrome, but there's still much to learn. Preventing human assisted spread of white nose syndrome remains an important way to protect bats from this disease. Spores of the fungus that cause WNS can persist for years in caves and mines, so it's important to follow proper decontamination guidelines even when no bats are present. Under no circumstances should clothing, footwear, or equipment used in a WNS-affected state or region be used in a state or region not affected by white nose syndrome. The preventative methods presented in this video are based on the latest scientific research and field-tested procedures. The Forest Service relies on relationships with partners to effectively manage cave systems and to keep our bats healthy. Together, we are working with cavers to slow the spread of the fungus that causes white nose syndrome by using proper decontamination procedures and by sharing their importance. Thank you for helping protect our bats.